Well, welcome to an EMG panel discussion. I'm Elliot Darvick. I'm here with Damian Navarro, Mike Funk, and Blaine Berenger. And uh, we'll be talking about the evolution of web and data, you know, data as three, you know, web 3.0. And this is stemming from a discussion uh, or a talk that Reed Hoffman gave uh, this past South by Southwest. So we're going to kind of talk just quickly about some of the points that he made. Uh, some examples of what data 3.0 could be and, and kind of the evolution of the web with data and then get into some questions that I thought will really spur the discussion along. So um, we'll start off with, uh, you know, kind of going back. So at web 1.0, right? So this was about, you know, Reed Hoffman says, go search, get data. So you have all these web pages out there and it was about how do we organize it through search. And then if we talk about web 2.0, it's thinking about, uh, real identities and real relationships, right? So it's not the, the dog in the chat room anymore, but you have your name attached to a Facebook identity, and it's about graphing, uh, it's the social graph and the relationships graphed online, right? And uh, Reed Hoffman was talking about Web 3.0, he says real identities generating massive amounts of data, right? And so what can you do with that data that's being generated, if you will, in Web 2.0? And so, just to set some context, I, I have some examples I've brought along. So, Great. right, always prepare. So the first one from LinkedIn. Uh, they have recently, a couple months ago, they launched skills and expertise. So I have a graph here, right? And the graph is uh, skills on the LinkedIn platform. So they can actually say that, you know, Android, right, as a skill, an Android developer, that's the 66th fastest growing skill on LinkedIn. So you think of like all this data, right? The skills we have, that's data. And what interesting things could you learn about different cities and the populations of you know, Android developer per city if you're a new business and you're looking where should we expand? Look at all that social data, our skills, and being able to map it and understand it. That's kind of one example. Uh, I love this piece on Facebook. Have you guys ever heard of this? No. Um, so this is a graph of uh, Israeli-Palestinian relationships over the last 24 hours on Facebook. So if you go to peace.facebook.com, they're taking all the social data, right, relationships, and mapping it to show that, well, actually, on a daily basis, you do have Israelis and Palestinians or Pakistanis and, in Pakistanis and Indians, you know, becoming friends, right? So that's another way of taking the social data and, and, and doing something really interesting with it. Um, the next big sound, and this is the last one I'll give, is, uh, um, is a website. I have a map here, a uh, graph. This is... Uh, Tupac on the top line and <laughs> Biggie on the second line, right? It's a way of uh, taking, and this is a compilation of likes on Facebook, followers on you know, Twitter, obviously, you know, it's being established by other people because they're not around anymore, but you can take any artist basically and get a composite view of all the social data around that artist. And uh, it's a website called The Next Big Sound, and Billboard actually created the Social 50, where it's ranking artists not by uh, sales, mm -hmm but just by social buzz and popularity online and plays on MySpace and the different uh, music sites. So it's just a way of using uh, data around artists to create rankings and show kind of a you know, re you know, relative comparison. So these are just some examples of you know, one way I've interpreted how social data is being used uh, to change how we understand the world around us. Um, so, you know, with that context set, that in large introduction, let's get into some, uh, you know, question time. It's very exciting. Um, Thanks so, for the context, though. Yeah. We appreciate it. Um, so the first one uh, is a fun question. If you could answer any question, right, you have with unfettered access to Facebook data, what question would you answer? <laughs> How much time people actually think about sex. Interesting. Okay. All right. Right. It always seems like one of the ones that are up, like how much time are people actually hmm. online not doing their work or not doing this, right? That's, so that's, is this maybe like areas of Facebook that they're browsing? Or, or how many people are cheating or how many people are this, right? From a consumer standpoint. Interesting. Yeah. The faith, the truly faithful versus the ones that are the stalkers. That are yeah. Always that's a real powerful one. So there's, <laughs> Checking out their exes. Yeah. Know, there's some implicit actions absolutely. maybe they're taking on Facebook that, you know, they don't know about it and Facebook knows about uh, it. Because you're public, what you put out there publicly that you say it on your wall is also very different from what your behavioral shows of where you're actually oh. spending time that isn't being, that is masked behind the data. The news feed is the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. Exactly. Nicely. Right. Yes, thank you. I think this year's, uh, this next year is going to be really interesting in terms of politics and the 2012 race. You know, how well the social networks 
play into um, favorite candidates sure. and um, how they progress with their campaigns. Um, I think we saw a little bit of that uh, in the last election, but I think it's going to be a much more powerful um, indicator of where things are at in terms of popularity. So you might you might take a, a look at all the data and maybe it's looking at which uh, you know candidates people are liking and try to maybe plot them on a map or try to understand oh, yeah. relationships. Like if you had access to you know people's political leanings as viewed through Facebook data, you would right. try to answer questions around the election. For yeah. sure, yeah, I think um, you know it might be an uh, early indicator of electoral vo college voting or so. I, right, you know, there could be a lot of ways to predict which way states will fall if you could extract the data from mm. Facebook. Well, so it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, so that example I gave earlier about a uh, piece on Facebook, so they have obviously country to country, but one of the interesting ones they have is a uh, political connection. Mm -hmm. So how many people in the last 24 hours, uh, how many liberals have made friends with conservatives? Nice. You know, yeah. So you could actually look that up now. Yeah. So it should be interesting to see. Uh, maybe that goes down as we get closer to election <laughs> I think it's always day. about anonymity, though. Who are these people, right? Because if you, there's one question you can answer, it's who are they? Right, because we sure. all, we always know the other side, which is the data performance and, and what trends are showing. But if you could actually target that back to the individual, hmm. that's really get to know our friends. Of course, which, <laughs> exactly. Hmm. Yeah, I would I would add to to De Blaine's, I almost see CNN showing you know the interactive maps and how they're moving you know identifying different states um, you know through the processes we're electing a new um, you know government is is correlating that data with with social data and seeing how things kind of manipulate across across the nation I think would be an interesting uh, an interesting evolution to communicating um, to people you know how that how those two things kind of play uh, play together I think would be kind of cool I'm almost wondering too what the level of um, analysis of the social networks mm -hmm. in 2012 will be compared to um, you know previous elections like how much yeah. emphasis was placed on social networks mm -hmm. monitoring, That's a great um, point. you know, and 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 how that will play into the overall campaign. Right. So I think uh, I think we're going to see a new way of engaging um, people to vote and um, get involved. In well, also government. knowing what to back. I mean, that's always the the trickiness with politicians is they're always trying to do some sort of test to understand. It used to be polling, right? surveying of yeah. what their constituencies want and are willing to vote for or get behind, right? So just in the way that marketers and agencies like us have become obsessed with the data, mm -hmm. who's to say that politicians, which, you know, help us all, sure. right? It's already a slow enough process, but if all of a sudden everybody starts to be consumed on the government side with the data, right? You know, what do they know is going to pass? What do they know the people are going to get behind? What are the hot trends and whether or not those start to, you know, to affect the types of policies that are being proposed and covered. Yeah, it's a yeah. very interesting point where maybe we start moving away from polling data, which has its mm -hmm. own uh, biases more towards we've seen that entertainment, social right? data. It's, yeah, sure. It has its own limitations. Excellent. Okay, well, let's move on to the, uh, the second question. So um, think about all the data that you're personally producing on a daily basis. So this mm -hmm. could be digital data, uh, analog data. Um, Implicit or explicit. Implicit would be the photos you're browsing. Explicit, right. you know, the status updates, you know. Um, so think about all that data. So of that data, what do you wish you had better access to? You know, just the way Nike allowed us to put the, you know, the chip you mean, in our shoe. What and, of our data? We yeah, wish exactly. You want to be able to had see access to right. data that you wish you could see. So I can see uh, my running data because I have a chip gotcha. in my shoe now from Nike, right? What data do you wish you had access to, and how do you think it would make your life better? I. I always say um, the best um, improvements in your quality of life come from the most simple applications of using data. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some examples. For example, um, having your refrigerator tell you what groceries you need to buy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, something as simple that people have, you know, gone to their fridge and made a list to it just happening automatically. Mm -hmm would be a huge time saver and um, something kind of fun that you can look at your mobile phone while you're at the store and you know exactly what you need to buy without having to even think about it. Um, same thing with other sort of large home appliances like you know, washing your clothes, turning on and off a microwave or an oven, all from a handheld device. Mm -hmm. That would be something that would, I think, simplify people's lives. 
if the technology could be pulled together. So it sounds like your consumption data, yeah. and kind of what you're eating on a weekly basis, it's, having better access to that and being able to plan out when you buy certain things. Yeah, yeah, and turning things on and off, timing things, right? like you know, being able to control a lot of what you do in life all from data and schedules and times. Hmm. And you can do that, and then public utilities are, doing, are trying to get to that level right now with individual appliances in your home and mapping them back to, my refrigerator uses this amount of energy each month, if I knew that, what could I do to, to, to reduce that consumption? Um, but what's really interesting is when you start comparing your data profile and your consumption with your neighbors. Yeah. And that's what they're doing right now is, is they're saying, you rank at they're, this they're level based utility. on the people around you. And that's when you start seeing real behavior change is, is when you start entering, you know, hmm. putting a gamification on your energy consumption. Totally, totally. It's really an interesting thing to see. So consumption in a different way, not exactly. necessarily food, but energy. Exactly. Yeah, well, know, in, a, in a great way. I mean, we're all naturally competitive. I mean, you see this in politics, right? I mean, you see this in every, every aspect of our life, education. Um, yeah, how funny to make it competitive. Turn it into a game, right? yeah. But what's the reward? I mean, I think we've talked about that before, especially mm -hmm. with, you know, so you have access to this data, you can see people's loyalty, but ultimately it's what do they get for it. It was really funny, I introduced a, a friend of mine to Foursquare, right, which Foursquare has had its ups and downs as far as, well, what really are we getting out of this? What are the badges? Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was funny to tie somebody back to somebody that was so fresh into Foursquare, is like, so he gets the first badge, right, the newbie badge. So what do I get for that? <laughs> and I was like, wow, I never really thought about that, right? It's an it's obvious like, question. Right, right. right. What do I, I get? So I got it? a badge. A badge. <laughs> just, I get a badge, right? What does that mean? So I think people, the commoditization of, of loyalty programs beyond simply status is something mm -hmm. that you've talked about, I know, before. What do you ultimately give them? Yeah, we love to measure our impact. We love to measure how many miles we've flown. And so, yeah, we were always, this is just data we're producing. And, you know, so coming up with interesting feedback mechanisms right. is, uh, yeah, it's an interesting part of that. Yep. All right, well, here's just a, a simple question. Who do you trust more uh, with your social data? Would it be the government or corporations, and I, why? I had a quick answer to that one. That would just be corporations. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because government, who's going to police the government, right? You always come out to the, you know, who's... who's Citizens, right? You have a well, vote and... kind of. I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, you know, at the other day, the government and the, their ability to control um, data privacy, in, in my respect, like they can legislate, right? We can actually put legislation in place. But ultimately, there's a second layer of checks and balances that you have with the government overseeing corporations. So it's almost like the protective nature of the government, you know, it, where corporations self-policing one another right. is, is very dangerous, right? Because there is still that, that profitization that they're always keeping an eye out, that, you know, the competitive nature of corporations against each other, how do you know they're always going to have your best interest at heart? So you, 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 Where the so government and, and public safety, right. right, that idea that there is, a, there is a tertiary level of protection that you're going to have simply because, and I know this is a future question of yours, what happens if the data gets out, right? The protectionism of, uh, across the social sphere is going to be, in the physical space, is going to be much more, I think, sensitive to a government entity than it is going to be to a corporate entity. That's, that's funny. You talk about the regulation component. I, my mind goes straight to corporations because of the, um, the rapid response or com in comparison, government tends to move very slow. Now, not all corporations move quickly, mm -hmm. but I think the ability for um, organizations to turn on a dime and to pivot, it, there's, a, there's a greater likelihood in that happening as opposed to getting the government to well, kind that's of what shift I actually, after. But that's what I'm saying. I trust the corporations more right. because of the fear of government. Right. Gotcha. Huh. That, that's why the, the fear of being tied up in regulations, the fear right, of right. letting that data release. The right. The liability is higher. Right. Because right. the government has a bigger stake in the game at sure. the end of the day. So now the government is so bloated and incapable. Of, like, I would rather them oversee it than actually manage the it's data security actually, itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, Damien, you trust your social data to corporations because there's better checks. Right. Mike would rather trust his social data to corporations because of their agility and playing would? I think, um, I think the data is meaningless unless you have multiple data sets. So, you know, so what that Facebook has okay. data on me, right. if they don't have my consumer behaviors, there's nothing they can really do to match it up and get something insightful. And your social security number, which the government has, and Correct. tax information, so the which minute the government has. The data starts to come together, multiple data sets come together, that's where magic occurs. That's where insight happens. Right. And as like long as multiple agencies 
have their own independent buckets of social right. data. It's, I mean, there's only so much they can do. So the so answer is both. The You'd answer is both. both. Yeah, but I'd rather have it separated. The minute partnerships start to happen or right. enforcement of data to be shared is the minute that pretty much in, insight can be created about you and mm -hmm. then inference can happen and people can predict your behaviors. So. And I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but my guess is the government has some strong backdoors mm -hmm. into corporations like Facebook day. and right. Google yeah. and, uh, you know, at, at some degree, I have to imagine. But, yeah, so there needs uh, to be we'll, a separation. We'll leave that for the message boards, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I, I like that. Yeah, um, I might be running for office soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one, okay, so um, what's the most clever use of social data that you've uh, personally seen incorporated into a product that you use? So I'll give a, an example just to sure. start things. So um, on my Android phone, um, when someone calls, I see their, first I see their photo, which is taken from my social network, right. and then I see their last status update from Facebook or Twitter. Um, it's not, it doesn't always work well, but in theory, it's just giving you a quick heads up as to what they're doing before you answer the phone. Mm -hmm. I think it could be executed better, um, but in theory, I think that's kind of a, a cool idea. So that would be you know, my, my personal example. Honestly, mine's super simple, and it would just literally be in the Yelp app when, um, you know, instead of having to search through uh, best restaurant, like things you should try, to take the three most common words in sequence that come up in all of the reviews and putting them at the top of the review list I see. was the most simple but the most effective I think rather than just looking at people's tips mm -hmm. right because you know tips it takes a certain action to leave a tip right it takes some time you just, I don't know if I trust that person as one as this writing the random things like try the try tip um, so that was that, I think that's so yeah. there's an aggregate amount of social data people's reviews right. it's automatically doing the social listening and, and posting the most smartly uh, the most repeated right whether good or bad I mean you know sometimes it's sure. not good like don't ever try that X Y and Z but usually if they don't have four stars you know you're not going to go on there manually it's my rule <laughs> <laughs> I think um, um, we were talking about this earlier is, is Nokia has an interesting partnership with Burden where they're integrating technology into clothing and hardware where snowboarders can actually track their data real time mm. and it's connected to their phone and essentially what it does is it turns your boarding experience into a real life game and you can link up with other people on the, on the slope and um, it taps into um, your accelerometer and, and your geolocation and everything cool. and as you do tricks on the slope it gives you points um, into like a real life game mm. and the opportunities and the capabilities are endless for something like this and I've seen it now done in skateboards with hardware um, on skateboards and I just saw the first um, surfboard integrate this type of technology where you turn you take an action sports that you, you know something that you do outside and you turn it into a real-life action sports game and it's just there are so many pop possibilities with that it's just it makes my head spin well and, and you're seeing that everything every everybody wants to capture it you had mentioned that earlier i know even with like crossfit right this is a crossfit mm -hmm. that i'm part of you know you go to the, the beyond the whiteboard and post everything like your times or this or that just so you could get an understanding of where you sit within the larger social sphere interesting um yeah, so right, i think that physical what happens in the physical and that it's making its way to digital where it used to be that was the digital. Now we want to replicate the physical, right? Mm. We would see things in, uh, online. We're like, oh, I want to try that. I want to beat that time. Now it's it's almost moving data the other way. I'm taking actions, producing data online right. that can be used for games or competitive first purposes. Or lifestyle management. Yeah, or that's really, really cool. I think, um, I think some interesting things are happening where personal data intersects with our daily life data. And an example of, um, it's not necessarily social, but it's, I guess it's personal data um, that I heard recently is uh, in the city of Los Angeles, there's actually parking uh, bumps that are being installed um, on street streetways where parking meters are. And when a car is over it, it turns off. And when a car isn't there, it turns on. And it basically wow. alerts an app that if you're in that general area, there's a, a parking space available. Mm. And I think geolocation is going to be a really important piece of data, not only for marketers, but also for utility. Where am I compared to the other data that's available out there and how do those two data points intersect to make my life easy? It could be shopping, it could be parking, it could be 
um, weather. It could be, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff, um, traffic that will influence your life only when it's intersected with your own personal. I had something funny to, to add to Blaine's uh, little case that sure. he was talking about, the bumps. You know, the other thing that has come from that is that the city also is installing them, not just so that you know where they're at, but also so that as soon as the car moves over, even if there's time left on the meter, it resets. So that you can no longer yeah, grab yeah. somebody else's Sneaky. time, right? So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, even if there's two hours left and somebody didn't well, it know. Well, sounds like the system's going to pay for itself. And well, right, there you both go. Wins, exactly. So. How is that fair? <laughs> Uh, well, a final question. Um, so imagine for a second that hackers have created a massive WikiLeaks type database uh, from Facebook user data and behavior. Right? <laughs> Pretty scary. Uh, what happens next? So describe for me your doomsday scenario. Large temporary prisons for. Well, what happens? I mean, with the data, what do people like? You know, what do people learn about each other that creates chaos or maybe nothing at all? Yeah, I don't think it'll be nothing at all. I mean, I think personal <laughs> personal relationships will, will be destroyed, I mean, in some ways. I mean, if you're looking at uh, many of the things that people will have access to. I don't know. Some people will probably say, is it really going to matter? Is, really, mm -hmm. is anybody going to really care? I think a select group of the population could exploit it, absolutely. Um, I think from a, a, a fiscal standpoint, you know, what happens um, is, is the bigger thing. You know, how do you prosecute? How do you... Sure. Right? That's... That's the breakdown that I'd be interested in. That's going to be more chaotic at the system level, but the personal level. I think personal level, it'll be a little chaotic for the first couple of weeks. You know, divorces will will be started, and uh, relationships might prosper. But ultimately, I think it's going to be the the, the larger uh, legislative system that's bogged down for something like that. Yeah, I would wonder if governments would overreact just the way they kind of have already with right. WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, do you yeah, see a tremendous reverse? I mean, obviously, I think people the level of trust for people would go right. down, so you'd see less usage. But yeah, how would the government react and regulating? And but generationally, we're already seeing that the younger generations could care less about privacy. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, that they, they, they don't have that, that same I don't know, connectivity to it like we used to, where, you know, the older generations absolutely, I think, are the ones that are overreacting, which are the ones that are in government. So know? maybe all the actions the younger generations are taking are under the assumption those actions will be exposed one day anyways. Anyways. Right. Or so that they already matter. are. Or, I mean, or the conspiracy, you already said it, that they already are. That the government already has access to this, right? Anything that's so. a zero and yeah. one attached to it, somebody has access to it. I mean, think how, how, how if, if we had asked somebody 10 years ago, you're going to enter your credit card information onto a device right. that's going to give you access or be able to purchase things through, uh, you know, a box on your desk. People think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think the level of comfort um, that people will eventually get to, it, it's going to be very hard to, to get people, I don't know, to cringe and hesitate to give anything away. I mean, there'll be a, there'll be a point, I think, when it's, it's, everything is very transparent. Right. But uh, going back but to your point. what does Doomsday look like? I, you know, I don't, the question, I, Mike. I, and I don't know. I think, I think as time goes on, that likelihood of doomsday gets less and less just because people become more comfortable, right? right? Become, they become more used to giving away their data. And, and the value in that data is like what Blaine was saying. It's not necessarily a data set. It's the correlation of data and, right. and how you make meaning with that data. Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think the big indicator, though, is, is when that doomsday comes, how long it is from now till then, it's going to have huge effects on how impactful it is. But I, I, I keep saying, like the, I, the only impact that I can possibly think of is is the sexual revolution. Kind. Relate, it's really well, just relationships. Right. Yeah. I mean, think about what other data do we really want hidden, except well, for what... Uh, well, I mean, let's there's say obviously, maybe. like, anybody that is already corrupt can have access to any number of data sets, like uh, you know, our social security number, our IDs, our credit cards. I mean, most of those... Could easily be captured already. Well, think about LinkedIn. I mean, you have a, you have employees, right? And the employee, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, you could say like if pe all that Who's data. On, what's that? No, I'm, yeah, exactly. Are, you know, are they messaging certain, you know, following certain companies? Could you, you know, basically be able to predict who's about to jump? So there, you have to you have to imagine too. A good company should know that already. You know what I mean? Like those are the types of things that aren't chaotic to me, right? Yeah, like, fair enough. Knowing all the Republicans that might be gay might be <laughs> a little bit, you know, when they're on a uh, a certain. Uh, war path against whatever, right? Or, sure. or re like religious or the conservatives, you know, anybody or opposite, right? Liberals that might be donating towards um, uh, a heavy sect in the Middle East, right? What, I mean, those are the types of things that I think are going to be uprooted. Our people in power are the ones There's, that are going to be worried. I think the, the interesting thing to remember is the only reason 
um, WikiLeaks was an issue mm -hmm. was because there was no truth to real data, right? Data was being hidden and then it was leaked. So in the same sense, um, the only time there would be a, an issue with your social data mm -hmm. being leaked is if you're posting something that's not authentic or true online or you're living a double life or you're that's what i'm talking about so exactly. yeah. it's too authentic we're right. talking about and most at least social people's data. social data you know you're using real photos right. you're saying real things about your yep. life so i don't know that there would be a revolution per se mm -hmm. or some um, major catastrophe doomsday, doomsday. But I, yeah doomsday but i think that people would take a step back and go to what's familiar which is face to face right phone calls and we know that world works Mm -hmm. You know, it has for many, many years. So there would just be a reversion of how we communicate to each other. Sure. Right now, you know, if you go to any modern homes, um, family dinner table, everyone's on their mobile devices and nobody talks at the table, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's probably extreme, but um, we've lost this sense of face-to-face -face communication and uh, normalcy in lives. And I think it might, might be nice to hit the reset button and get an authentic conversation happening. But some would also argue that the social channel is just simply an, an, a modern telephone line and that, if anything, we are more, just because I saw the counter argument done recently on a documentary saying that all of the social networks is allowing us to be more of our human selves, which is even more social, which is even more ingrained beyond what a face to face can do, right? Because you can only be face to face with so many people that if you were to talk to a younger generation, I think you're going to get saying, actually, I feel closer to these people yeah. than I ever could have done seeing them. In the classroom once a day face to face right i know everything about their lives closer to than I, and i feel that way about some of my friends that i've either lost touch with you're like wow i feel like i'm ingrained in their lives i feel like i could run in tomorrow and be like oh my god you have three kids how they're doing i saw one in baseball right so is there well, a counter argument we've too? seen good things happen from uh access to social data you know there's been a lot of um a lot of uh up rival in terms of democracy and um, you know countries sort of banding together for their freedom mm -hmm. and the more data the more that personal data is accessible by others um, people can organize people can uh, you know get excited and can um, maneuver and I think it's pretty yeah bringing transparency it's bringing transparency, transparency and I think as long as social networks are embedded in transparency, mm -hmm. there can never really be a WikiLeaks situation. There really can't because everyone, for the most part, I feel as being honest on a social network, except for maybe um, people who are uh, like lurking on children or something. <laughs> you know, but, but I but, asked a provocative question, so I appreciate everyone's honesty. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. I think it's the people in power that are hiding something are the ones that are going to, it's going to be the scariest to Politicians see Politicians should get off Facebook is what Pretty you're much, saying. Yeah. Okay. Unless they're putting exactly what they feel. Well, I thought we'd uh, end on an exercise, so uh, word association. Damien, social data. Power. Limitless. Uh, infancy. Uh, personal privacy. Openness. Go to blame, then come back to me. <laughs> personal what? privacy. Personal privacy. I think, um, is it one word answer here? <laughs> <laughs> word association, so yeah, yeah um, just word. <laughs> personal privacy is um, not allowed in the social space. Okay. Becoming less of an, of an issue. Okay. Final, uh, data 3.0. I still think it's engagement, not data. Okay. I smell a book. <laughs> <laughs> data 3.0. I think data 3.0 is the intersection of social data and marketing data. Okay. And you learned a lot that we can't answer with one word very often. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, this is awesome. Plenty of words spoken here today. Hope you guys have enjoyed this and uh, more to come. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you.